So we have on the line Rabbi Gutierrez from Texas. How's it going, Rabbi? Uh, it's going good. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Uh, yes. Uh, so I um, am uh, from a crypto Jewish background. I guess you could say it's sort of I've sort of a Renaissance man. I guess at least that's been my goal. I have an engineering background, but I also have a religious, uh, obviously, studies background. I work as an engineer, um, and I also have, for about 15 years, uh, studied part-time in different Jewish institutions. And so I, um, I sort of went an academic route as well as a rabbinic route, and I sort of do that as a personal passion, and uh, I, I feel like a personal calling. Uh, but I'm still, you know, gainfully employed as an engineer, take care of my family. And um, I work uh, extensively with people that are from crypto Jewish backgrounds. They may have a tradition in their family that, you know, says that they were descendants of Anasim or Bananasim or Conversos. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, Christians because of that, because they're sort of uh, most Anasim are, are, you know, they have some type of obviously Christian experience in some form or fashion. Um, and uh, I guess if, if that were to sum it up, I would say that's probably the, just of who I am and and what I do. Mm -hmm. You're Hispanic? Uh, Yes. From where? Well, my mother was born in Texas, but she grew up in Monterrey in uh, Mexico. And then my father was born in Monterrey. um, And then uh, they came to the U.S. back in the 1960s. So my mother was actually born in the U.S., but she came back uh, after they were married. So uh, to a Mexican background. Yeah, Mexican-American. I have a similar background. Well, my family's from Colombia. I'm first generation American. I converted to Judaism 22 years ago. Before that, I was a Christian. I went to seminary as a Christian, and I came to the realization that JC wasn't God of the Messiah, and then I felt I was forced to become Jewish. I felt it was thrust upon me. So that's what I did. I was lucky to have grown up in a Jewish community. I grew up in Miami Beach, and I've always been near Jews. I was born in Passaic, New Jersey. But I ended up converting. After I converted, I moved to Israel. I learned in yeshiva there. I worked in outreach for many years for some rabbi named Jeff Seidel. I also work for a living. I'm a network engineer. Torah is also a passion of mine. And that's what I do on the side. And this is what I encourage people to do. Like if we could learn anything from Perkovo, it says don't make a spade out of the Torah. And I think that when people get paid to teach Torah, they become a puppet to those who pay him. Um, But I I, I think that's a very good point. There's a a small Chabarah that I lead, uh, the Har Yisrael. It's it's a traditional Chabarah, and uh, sort of like UTJ, Union for Traditional Judaism Mm -hmm. style. And um, it's something that we've, you know, done since uh, we've, uh, I've been married since 2011. I got married sort of late in life, but... uh, we only have a few services a month, but yeah, I, I can understand that. I mean, I, I've seen people that once they get into a, a pulpit position, you know, there's, they're sort of always concerned about membership and that kind of thing. And um, I understand that, you know, people have to make a living, you know, if they're going to uh, focus in and the Jewish community as well. But I've always been grateful for the fact that I, I uh, studied engineering and so that I don't necessarily have that. I'm not bound to that, you know, in case of, if somebody doesn't like something that I say or, or, you know, what have you, I don't have to be concerned about being, I guess you could say, politically correct. What stream of orthodoxy would you say that you align yourself the most with? Um, well, I would say in reality that it would be uh, uh, the UTK. Uh, so that would be sort of the old style conservative movement, um, sort of orthodox in education. Um, and then, uh, you know, the conservative, the old style conservatives were really what we would call conservadox. Um, so they would, you know, they were very traditional in terms of liturgy, in terms of uh, learning halakha, but in terms of some of the practicalities, um, I, I think in many ways it would mirror like a lot of, uh, you know, predominantly Israeli Sephardic communities where you have a mix of people that drive and some people don't drive. And it's just sort of a wide range. Everybody fits under one tent. Um, you know, I I was a member of a reformed temple. I was a member of, you know, conservative synagogue, you know, traditional, et cetera. But um, the thing I liked about the UTJ and, and sort of, um, I don't know if you would call it sort of modern orthodox or the left, the progressive element, not not in terms of what I would call morality, but I, I think there's this openness to scholarship, because um, that's the environment that I was I was trained in at, at Siegel College and at Spurtis. You know, it was very academic, 
And so there was a range of there were a range of individuals who were Orthodox. We had one rabbi that was had smicha from uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein. Uh, and we had some from that had smicha from um, uh, Joseph Dosilovechik. And then we had a lot of people that were from the conservative background. In fact, the, the one that impacted me the most was the one that I, the rabbi that I speak about the most is Rabbi Byron Sherwin. So he was the protege of Abraham Joshua Heschel uh, at the at the uh, Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Uh, and there were also Reform and even some some uh, Reconstructionist uh, people uh, at the different institutions. Um, but I, I would say that sort of old style conservative, which I think was sort of within the bounds of orthodoxy. So that would be sort of my general philosophy. Mm-hmm. So, so I know the I know JTS actually started off as an orthodox institution, even though that phrase wasn't thrown around till after the '60s. And it was um, the founders of Young Israel actually came from JTS. Uh, but how would you say that Judaism pre-1956, I think it was 1956 when the rabbinical assembly said that one could drive to the closest synagogue, how would you say the conservative movement, how has it changed since then? Well, I think that, uh, I would say that, I would say that it still operates under the guise of halakha, but I think that the reality is that it's really become, uh, I would almost say like almost every ism out there has become like a major issue of concern and that and that the uh what is politically correct is ultimately what is going to dominate uh you know the the policies and the halakhic observance so what's happened in the conservative movement is that most conservative jews do not really live conservative jewish lives anymore um in reality they live reformed jewish lives or even if you might describe even secular lives the only difference is that in the service itself you know it's uh, I would say it's fairly traditional. You know, there's a lot of Hebrew. Um, you know, the the liturgy, for the most part, depending on the context, isn't changed. I mean, there might be some, quote unquote, modernizations uh, about you know gender references to God or something like that to Hashem. But it used to be that conservative Jews were were observant. You know, for the most part, and so they took Kashrut seriously. They took Shabbat. You know, there might be some different allowances and different philosophies, but it was very. It was something that they took, took seriously, and I think nowadays most conservative Jews, you know, they see it as, as a more secure way to maintain Jewish identity, but I think that maybe the spiritual component is, is not there. And that, that was a big critique of uh, Rabbi uh, Heschel, you know, that the conservative movement and American Judaism in general had really become devoid of, of God. Um, and so that, I think, is sort of a sad reality if you, if you look at the conservative movement today, I think, um, you know, it used to be something like 40, 45 percent of the American Jewish community. And I think it's dropped down to something like, uh, you know, 20 percent or something like that. I, mm-hmm. I, I remember looking at the numbers a couple of years ago and um, it's it's in some sense it's collapsed in, in terms of numbers. And a lot of conservative synagogues actually have merged uh, with reform or they're sort of on the edge of it because they can't sustain it numerically. Being Sephardi. Do you consider it almost a conflict of interest to try to hold by the rulings brought down by the rabbinical assembly? Because they're typically always leaning towards the Ashkenazi world instead of the Sephardi world. Well, I would say that in reality, most of my training was in, in an Ashkenazic environment. Um, in the in Zohar Yisrael, in the Chabara that, that we have in our home, uh, you know, we use an Ehot Sidur. We also have some uh, Spanish, Portuguese Sidurim from uh, like the ones that are used at uh, Sheriff Israel. Uh, in New York and, and some of the other uh, Spanish Portuguese communities. But the reality is that most of my training was in an Ashkenazic background. So uh, it, I think that the natural tendency of American Jewry is to lean that way, unless you're in a very, uh, like in a Syrian community or a very, you know, Israeli community. Uh, I think most people, it's hard for them to, to find a community like that. Like I, I live in South Dallas County. Uh, so the majority of the Jewish community lives uh, you know, 40, 50 minutes away in the north. Um, and in the south, you know, we, we have uh, a lot of suburbs and there's, you know, maybe one synagogue per suburb. And, you know, there might be a Chabad or something like that in the mid-cities. But, you know, what we found is that, you know, we sort of had to, we had to create an environment that was as traditional as possible, but would draw from both Ashkenazic and Sephardic uh, uh and so forth, just to be as welcoming as possible. So 
you know, we would have some families uh, visit, you know, for some holidays from Chabad, and then we would have some families that, you know, were, uh, you know, like a Lebanese background, and then we would have other families that are essentially reform, but they like the liturgy, they like something more traditional. Um, and for whatever reason, maybe, maybe ethnically, uh, you know, they don't necessarily feel that they fit in, you know, maybe, because a lot of the people that we're dealing with are still, uh, like, you know, first or second generation uh, uh, Americans, you know, so a lot of them Spanish is, is a key issue. Yeah, my, my first language is Spanish, but it's not my forte. Um, uh, fortunately, my, my wife uh, is fluent. Um, she's from Mexico, well, Veracruz in Mexico City. And so we had a lot of people that just sort of naturally attracted to each other because of language and so forth. So it, it's it's always been sort of a challenge. I, that's why we I think the UTJ was like the perfect fit because it it reflected the reality. Um, and even though you know when it comes to halakha, we we you know I'll say you know this is the you know this is sort of the range of, of what's acceptable within what we would call orthodoxy. Uh, and I can't tell you you know not to do that or to do that, but I always try to give that particular perspective. And then you know people are going to fit in the way that they. Mm-hmm. You know, realistically can because we have people in the medical field you know we have people mm-hmm. just different career paths that you can't easily change because of your rabbinical training you wouldn't feel more comfortable in let's say a young israel or some sort of modern orthodox institution well uh it's interesting that you mentioned young israel because there, there's a young israel here in dallas but it's um it's not the typical young israel it's it's a sephardic young israel i think the israelis sort of took over it back in the 90s and and that that kind of environment is something that i love but uh, for various reasons, uh, financial, and also I think because I, I really do feel like I have somewhat of a mission, um, I sort of have to be in this kind of area because a lot of the people in this area are disconnected. Um, you know, they they may have grown up Jewish or they may be from a Benayi on a scene background or, you know, there, there's something there. And for whatever reason, family, jobs, um, you know, sometimes, we you know, we have intermarriages, that kind of thing. Um, they're not in a position where they can be connected to the rest of the Jewish community. And I think in that sense, um, even though we're small, you know, uh, we feel like a certain need. We, we fill a certain role. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're the only Jewish connection that people will have. And, I mean, it's sad, you know, because sometimes we only see people a, a few times a year, uh, you know, for Pesach or, you know, maybe one of the uh, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or something like that. But, um, I really feel like we're sort of dealing with, uh, you know, quote unquote, lost Jews, so to speak. Um, and, and if we're not here, you know, it might be, e- it would definitely be easier for my family. Uh, my immediate family I have, I have three boys, but, um, I think there are other families out there, you know, that, that would, would lose out on the little that we can provide. And, and in that sense, even though it seems like a little bit, you know, only, you know, can only do so much, it's, it's actually, in some occasions, it's quite a bit. You know, somebody, you know, God forbid, dies. Um, you know, you know, my mother passed away last year, um, and there were a lot of these people from the Chabura and other Chaburot in, in the area, and uh, you know, they really came together. You know, and and we've seen that for weddings, and we've seen that for uh, bar mitzvahs and things of that nature, and and so it's it's like a little community that you know has a purpose, and and I think that's what. Um, is is motivating to me to keep that going. Mm-hmm. The way most Orthodox Jews see reform and conservative is that it acts as a crutch for people who just refuse to assimilate. They see that as a negative thing. Sometimes assimilation is not a bad thing because if you almost force people to remain Jewish, keep them in some bubble, they begin to change Judaism to suit their lifestyle. This is why exile in my opinion, has always been a way to wash out the bad blood. When I say bad, I don't mean ethically bad, but unholy by Torah standards, by people who don't keep the Torah. This is what I see with the creation of the state of Israel. I think for the first time in Jewish history, we have people who are four, five, six generations Jewish and secular. While in Galut, after the the second generation, people get in some way recycled back into humanity possibly become Christian and then end up, God willing, back into Judaism when they're actually serious. It's really not a justification for the extreme right in Judaism uh, that does the opposite that the left does, right? Where the left takes away and the right adds too many things. 
So the balance is somewhere in the middle. But I don't think there's much of a future for conservative Judaism. Now, the Masorti movement is different. They tend to resemble the conservative movement of the 50s and the 60s. Okay. Yes. Perhaps the mixed dancing and this and that. I don't really see anything against halakha with the traditional conservative movement. And I think most Jews or most Orthodox Jews also welcomed people from JTS as as fully observed until 1956, till this, this edict of driving, which, mind you, the Orthodox community has really backpedaled on because the truth is, if Chabad did not accept people who drive to shul, they'd never have a minion. So sure. it's different when it's done as policy than when it's done as something we tolerate. And okay, they'll close the parking lot in the front, they'll leave it open in the back. But this is something that the earlier community would never have tolerated. So it shows that there's definitely a middle ground. But I actually spent some time in a conservative synagogue. Right when you start trying to make too many changes, someone's going to remind you this is a conservative synagogue. And they typically say that the only conservative Jew is a conservative rabbi. Because, like you said, the average congregant there lives more of a reform lifestyle. Was... No, I, I think that's a big challenge. I, I, I would say that um, I think because of my historical studies and just my personal experiences, I think there have been benefits uh, even from a reform movement be, uh, because it, it's, I think in a sense, theoretically, because of its, um, in the early days, you know, in the, in the late 1700s and 1800s, um, one of the big emphasis of the reform movement was, uh, I guess you could say sort of a return to, uh, to scripture, if you will. Um, and I guess you could sort of look at that in light of, you know, maybe the development of Protestantism and so forth. But I think, you know, in the, in the early days, there was a sense that, uh, you know, there were people that were knowledgeable about Minchagim, but they didn't even know uh, the Tanakh or something basic. And obviously, you know, you, you can get to the the question of, of uh, how much devote, you know, time should be devoted to something. But I, I think those kind of elements are, are positive. I, I don't think that necessarily these different movements are, are adhering to their ideals. But I think that in the past, these movements sort of brought to the table things that were part of the uh, if you will, part of the Jewish experience, and and they were sort of, if you will, renewing sort of, you know, maybe ma reminding people that hey, this is part of uh, of who we are. Um, but like all things, you know, in, in the 20th and 21st century, that that's also something that's sort of gone by the wayside. So I would agree, it's it's a very it's very difficult. I don't think uh, the future is is positive in that sense. There's a community uh, I won't mention the name of it. Uh, very nice community. Uh, that I've spoken at and, uh, you know, for, you know, for services, uh, you know, they might have, you know, 20 people. And this is a community that once had, uh, hundreds of kids in the, in their, in their Hebrew day school. And now it's, you know, they have like, you know, 10 kids or something like that. And, and I asked, uh, one of the, you know, uh, I think it was like the, I think they call the ritual director there. I said, you know, you know, what would happen? And he said, well, you know, just, there's, uh, demographic issues, you know, uh, People move away to other suburbs and, uh, you know, they used to have a, you know, two large buildings and now they have, uh, one. Um, and so you see that and it's, it's, you see this decline, but, but then at the same time, uh, you know, I see, maybe it's just Texas, but I, I see other groups, even, you know, Chabad and, and a lot of the, uh, even Orthodox groups, you know, they're, they're still small. They, they meet in homes, you know, they, they still have difficulty, um, you know, getting traction, I guess you could say. You've got some of the bigger uh, shuls, but, a few years ago, there was one very well-known shul in, in Dallas or Hatora. They, they went bankrupt, and uh, they're still operating. They were able to reorganize, but it, it's very difficult to keep up, uh, you know, facilities. And if you have multiple rabbis and that kind of thing, and, and I just, uh, you know, it, it's sad. I mean, I don't know. It, mm -hmm. It's not an easy uh, path, you know, mm -hmm. to make successful. Well, the reform movement has also come a very long way. I mean, initially, the only way to really contrast or tell the difference between a reform congregation and an orthodox one was that the orthodox gave their sermon in yiddish and the reform gave it in german yes and it wasn't until it became americanized through hebrew union college and the whole shrimp affair right that they served oyster and shrimp in the first graduating class of hebrew union college that things began to take a huge nosedive and it really hasn't recovered since then so things progressed 
I guess, more to the left or more in a social progressive way than more towards Torah. Not so much tradition because they were right to want to change tradition. The Orthodox weren't doing great things either, especially with being open. There is no doubt that if someone wants to convert to Judaism, they're going to be welcomed and treated much, much better in a reform or conservative synagogue than in an Orthodox synagogue. And it really shouldn't be that way. It seems that according to orthodoxy, to be religious is to be primitive and backwards. And this is why well, the it, reform it, 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 called them orthodox. Yep. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you note that because um, in the in the 1800s, a lot of, um, uh, you probably you probably know about it, but uh, I think it was Beth Elohim in South, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, it started off as a Spanish-Portuguese synagogue, one of the first uh, four and uh, in the United States. And um, in Europe, a lot of the reform uh, uh, temples actually look to uh, Sephardic models, specifically the Spanish-Portuguese model in, in London and in Amsterdam, um, and sort of, I guess you could say, almost like that Baroque, you know, style environment. Uh, the, the the liturgy was very ornate and uh, very beautiful, you know, very impressive. They looked to that because they saw that uh, even Hebrew, of course, they they wanted to they switched over to Sephardic pronunciation Hebrew, but they look to that as an elevation of liturgy, um, and it's like sort of they had like an idea of what of what they wanted to do to elevate the service. But I, I think you're right. I think once you you came into the uh, the American experience, um, it, you, it's sort of like you can't stop. You know, it's like you 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 have to uh, face the rushing water, and, and there's no way to to put a barrier there. So I I, I look to that, and I, I find it fascinating that. You know, they look to orthodoxy as a model, but, you know, it's just it's just a question of not being able to uh, draw the line in the sand, I guess you could say, where they would be committed to halakha or, or uh, you know, where how far they were willing to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, and a, so it's, it's tragic in that sense. How do you feel about encouraging people to convert to Judaism or to consider converting to Judaism? Um, I sort of am a little bit conflicted about that. I think... Um, in many ways, I I always put it on the table for people, um, but at the same time, um, a lot of the people that are very instrumental in, in my religious education, like Rabbi Byron Sherwin, uh, you know, they were very conciliatory towards uh, towards Christianity. So I I mean that's obviously sort of the I guess you could say in many ways the minority view. Um, I, I wrote a one of the books that I wrote was actually on this sort of minority view of, of Christianity. Uh, particularly by uh, many Italian rabbis uh, in the Renaissance and, and into the 1800s. So I, I sort of in many ways discourage people from from doing that. Uh, but at the same time, if if it's not like I push them away or something, but I just I always try to tell them, you know, to take into account uh, the complications, especially, um, you know. If they're single, you know, if, you know, what are they going to do in terms of marriage, their family, their parents? Um, I, I've seen a lot of cases where people uh, become very, um, I guess you could say, zealous. Uh, I had, I, I was thinking about this this week. I had a friend who was a, uh, a Pentecostal preacher. This is, you know, many, many years ago, um, and then he uh, eventually uh, sort of went through stages, and then event, you know, I'll just sort of skip some of the stages, but. He wound up in in uh, Israel in the West Bank. Uh, he, he you know he had converted I think like twice, um, and then uh, something happened and he just sort of you know became uh, if not an you know atheist agnostic and you know he it, it's just sort of very tragic you know he moved his family he cut off relations with his with his parents and and uh, there was there were you know personal conflicts because of you know this. Uh, I guess you could say this antagonism to his previous uh, religious identification. And um, I've had other friends like that, you know, that, you know, I see them and, you know, some of them don't become as embittered or anything like that. But um, I, I have to be honest and say, I think in his case or in other cases, it may have been better for them to stay mm-hmm. uh, as, as Christians and, and be devoted to, uh, I, I believe, uh, a faith that is centered, you know, on the God of Israel, obviously not necessarily in, in, uh, uh, one might say ideally, you know, in different issues, of course. But so I think just based off those kind of experiences, I am a little bit more reserved. Um, I have done some uh, conversions, and I'm always very careful to 
to try to have people, uh, you know, like almost, you know, make it hard for them in terms of the education, not because I want to make it difficult, because I want them to be prepared, mm -hmm. because I want them to, to have like a, a full disclosure, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so um, I, I've had some very, I think, very good situations. You know, I had one student that uh, went to yeshiva and, and just an incredible individual. He, he wound up going to Orthodox Shiva and also getting a master's uh, degree in Jewish studies. So he's sort of like me, you know, the dual uh, academic and, and uh, you know, spiritual religious route. Um, and then I see other people that it, it's sort of like, um, I don't know, that, you know, just like they, with a season or a, a, a fad and then sort of go through that. And I don't know, I just, mm -hmm. it, it's disappointing to me on a personal level, but, uh, I don't think it's good for them either because I think, you know, who, who knows what they're going to do, you know, in, in another year or two or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually, you, probably, you don't know this, but I had actually come across your uh, probably, I think you've been making videos for what, for about 10 years at least or something like that. It's 2006. Um, yeah, or even, yeah. So I, I think I came across your site, uh, uh, your videos back in 2007 or eight or something like that. And um, you actually had a, uh, like a, a conversion uh, uh, curriculum online. And um, I looked at that, you know, you had different categories and um, I looked at that and I, and I actually used that as a model. I added quite a bit to it, to be honest. Uh, and I gave like different options, but um, I remember, you know, your perspective was very interesting to me back then. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was a little bit more, as you could say, uh, almost like evangelistic, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. to use that term. Um, but I've always sort of, you know, seen the spectrum and, and I've almost, I think, tried to sort of customize it to people, you know, what is the particular situation that they're in mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, are they really thinking about the, the, the whole picture? So you know? it sounds like you've taken this approach because Judaism as it exists today and Jews are not equipped to welcome in newcomers, correct? Uh, yes. I mean, the reality is, is that I have had many cases in which people have faced, um, you know, discrimination, racism, um, you know, I, I think I've seen every scenario possible. I've seen uh, conversions that were done under Orthodox supervision rejected by conservative rabbis. I've seen reform conversions accepted by conservative rabbis. I, I've seen every combination you can think of. I could probably name like four or five different ones. And, and it's just, it's been mind blowing. Um, and so I, I sit down with people and I, I, I hate I feel like I'm a Debbie Downer, you know, like I, I tell people, you, I need you to understand uh, the negative aspects. And of course, I think the positive aspects, I, I dwell on those as well. But it's almost just a, a pragmatic approach, you know. Mm. Um, you know, we have some friends that, you know, they went through uh, your program. And, you know, we've talked about it, you know, quite a bit. You know, why, why do I have like a, what they would consider to be a, a stricter approach? And I said, it's just personal experience, you know, that people, Maybe maybe they got into the wrong communities or, um, you know, it's interesting to me because a lot of, um, since I deal mainly with, with uh, Hispanics or Latinos, um, it's almost as if, you know, they're wanting to, I, I don't know if the word is integrate too quickly, but, um, you know, they're, they're still often dealing with some of the issues that an immigrant might have, uh, you know, linguistic issues and, and American culturalization and so forth. And sometimes they sort of gravitate toward an environment that I don't think they're ready for educationally, um, and and they're not necessarily ready for to 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 have some of the responses you know that that they might uh, have, and and sort of they they get sort of you know uh, turned off by that, and mm -hmm. and I feel like I have to sort of it's not like I don't, I don't want to give like a negative picture, but I I feel like I'm I have a responsibility to paint a realistic one. And then sometimes they, they do just great. You know, they find the right community and uh, or they might move or something like that. And, and I they, they just find the perfect place. And so it's just a mixed bag, you know, that that, uh, that that I've seen. Right. I respect that approach, although I confront it from a different perspective. I feel that if we, we don't make converts and we don't encourage people to convert, things will never change. If we don't pack synagogues with people of color, black, Asian, Hispanic, their presence in the synagogue won't become the norm. So I tell people, and I've said it many times, that we're almost like the pawns. 
We're almost like soldiers put on the front line to die. And we're setting up the scene. We're trying to make things a little better for the next generation. But it's true. Anyone who converts nowadays is going to suffer, especially if he looks different, if he speaks different, if he can't afford to live in a Jewish community or to have all the fancy things that wealthy Jews have. From my perspective, I look at the bigger picture and I think that if things don't change, if we don't act a little unorthodox, then by definition we'll never improve. So this is why I've taken the approach I've taken, not because I don't realize that what you said was true. It's absolutely true. The Jewish community as it exists is not equipped to accept newcomers. But it's not that it was never equipped I really attribute it to the rise of mysticism and Judaism moving inward, this notion that there are no enemies from within and, and everyone from the outside is an anti-Semite. I appreciate your perspective, but then you would have to acknowledge that Christianity is, according to Jewish law, it is a viable path for these people to remain in then. Uh, well, I mean, that that's actually, uh, some, you know, like I mentioned, uh, I've been writing on and... Um, Yes, I mean, I think that it's not a necessarily ideal form, and I think that that sort of makes people frustrated because I tend to, they want black and white answers, and I think that there's, like anything, there's a spectrum. I, I remember Byron Sherwin, my, my rabbi at, at Spurtis, um, you know, he, he had a, a, someone from Latin America came up to him and asked him, you know, do I need to convert to Judaism? Uh, gave him sort of like the, the classical Christian question, you know, to be saved. And, uh, you know, Rabbi Sherwin gave him a very controversial answer. He said, no, you're fine in, in your faith. Now, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, Sherwin and a lot of the other rabbis that I studied with were very active in uh, interfaith dialogue. Um, Rabbi Chaim Beck was uh, personal friends of um, uh, the uh, Ratzinger, uh, Pope Ratzinger. Um, you know, he had been one of the cantors that sang um, in the Great Synagogue for Pope John Paul II, um, you know, many of the rabbis that I studied with, uh, Rabbi Asher Lopatin, uh, signed, uh, there was an, a statement uh, by 50 Orthodox rabbis regarding Christianity, I think it was signed in 2015, uh, and it was basically, it, it was sort of a, a reciprocity, uh, reciprocity of, of uh, Vatican II, I guess you could say, from from a Jewish standpoint, from Orthodox rabbis. Um and it was it was controversial, of course, and, it, and it's certainly the minority view. But um, I think that the, at least on paper, and, and, and I always have uh, people that remind me that you know what's on paper versus what's reality is different. At least on paper, um, especially the Catholic Church has made a lot of uh, changes in its approach to Jews. So my my main concern is anti-Semitism and uh, supersessionism. You know what they call replacement theology. Um, and, and of course, some of the liturgical issues with uh, that you know that were part of the, the liturgy. Uh, so they've they've made a lot of uh, changes, at least on paper. And, and many uh, you know priests and, and bishops and cardinals have expressed you know very different views uh, regarding Jews and Judaism. Um, I guess you could say sort of like a, a like a dual covenant. You know, there's two different approaches, and, and you could sort of put one under like a Noahide type umbrella. Uh, and then Christianity would be sort of under that umbrella. Um, but I, I do have a more positive stance toward it, and I think part of it is because um, it's it's those personal uh, experiences, you know, where people who don't necessarily, you know, they don't have a, a dog in the hunt, you know, in terms of the welfare of the Jewish community, but in their understanding, you know, they they have a very positive view. Um, and I think, I think, um, because of the, the people that I deal with, you know, that are coming from uh, banana seam backgrounds and things, what I have found is that, it's imp- at least this is my personal view, it's, it's important for me that they do not have a negative view. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to recognize the history, which, you know, again, I, I write about extensively, uh, Inquisition and, and anti-Semitism and, and so forth, but um, I, I feel like it's more positive for them to see the benefits and the, the, the positive aspects uh, in their family, especially because sometimes, you know, their family members are not going to be on board with what they're doing. And and sometimes I've seen them become so negative and embittered that it, it's almost uh, like their entire Jewish focus is, uh, you know, calling everybody else uh, uh, an idolater. And, and this is Abu Dazara and this is the, and it's like, 
I understand the the passion. I understand the emotions, but I, I think when there's more positivity and just the recognition that uh, I think that, uh, and I think the Rambam says this, you know, uh, and others have said this, you know, that that the name of Hashem has been promulgated throughout the world um, in a way that maybe we couldn't do as as a community. Um, I, I wanted to say something that you had mentioned before, um, you know, the Maharaj. Uh, you know, Rabbi Judah Lowe, Prague had almost, you know, this kind of sense that there was something innate within Jews that, you know, a, a non-Jew could never really convert. I mean, if they converted, it was because they, they were really a Jewish soul, right, that had been lost. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, you see that that stream of thought. I think within many uh, streams of, of of Judaism today. But I, I think it's on, on one level, I think it's sort of dangerous because it, it's almost like a uh, a quasi uh, racial theory and I, I think that one of the things that was imparted to me was the issue of uh, of detente you know respect if if we can sort of sit at the table uh, and acknowledge that you know there are differences that are very significant but i do think that christians uh you know have a desire to worship the god of israel now the implications of that you know are are often very different and and very problematic from a philosophic standpoint, philosophical standpoint, but I I don't have the same uh, negative view I think that that others would have. And and again, I, I understand the history, I understand the the theology. Um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with, I'm sure you are, but Rabbi Irving Greenberg um, wrote a book called uh, for, I think it's called For the Sake of Heaven, um, and it was sort of this kind of you know this reconsideration of of Christianity, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, maybe it's it's the benefit of living in the, the 21st century where we can sort of step back a little bit. Uh, but I, I think it's just, you know, something that at least should be considered, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and I often have, I had a case uh, recently when I was I was uh, lecturing at a, a local, uh, it's actually a like a reform slash conservative synagogue. Um, it was interesting because there was an African American African American woman. Who had converted to Judaism, and my topic was on, um, I think it was, what is uh, Jewish thinking? Um, and then all of a sudden, it had nothing to do with the topic. I was wrapping up, and she says, "I have a question. Why, why did you, why did Jews and Judaism have such a negative view towards Christianity?" Uh, and she said, "I was a Christian, and my studies, you know, led me to, uh, to, to Judaism, to to embrace the Torah, and so forth." And so it was a it was a very interesting dialogue, and a lot of you know I I felt sort of uh, in a corner because a lot of the people you could tell felt a little uncomfortable, and uh, you know I I all I did was appeal to uh, you know different rabbis in Dallas, uh, uh, Rabbi Sanan Schlesinger, who was one of the signatories or uh, he signed the uh, the Orthodox statement regarding Christianity. I talked about some of the rabbis I had studied with um, and other people, and and it was sort of. Uh, it was an interesting discussion because you had someone who was from an African American background who had experienced, uh, you know, good things in, in, you know, their Christian upbringing. And then they were bringing this to the table as now as a Jew. Um, and so it was, it was interesting. And I think that maybe because I worked so much with crypto Jews, um, I think it's always on the table and it's just something that, you know, I have to sort of, I have to deal with it on some level. And, uh, so it's not, you know, it's not popular, but, I think that's mm -hmm. the approach that I've taken. Right. So I don't encourage a Christian lifestyle, although in life we're typically dealing with the best being an enemy of the better here. So clearly in many cases it benefits someone to remain a Christian than to hop into some limbo style religion like Noidism that I've seen many times, like you said, gets people to drop everything and to actually war against the notion of God and religion. But again, oh, I would, I would agree with that. I would agree. But again, I still think that's reactionary. That's not because I don't think it's the ideal. I, I mean, I think Torah is definitely the ideal and conversion is definitely the ideal, but because Jews have a broken moral compass, but that doesn't mean that we in some way have to keep people from coming in, but we have to try to work from within to change things. And the truth is Judaism in itself, Torah in itself, doesn't deal with trying to save the world or trying to bring the world to this notion of ethical monotheism, not in the five books of Moses. 
not for Gentiles or for Jews who go away. This whole Kiru movement is probably less than 100 years old. No one in the town would practice this. But what the Torah is adamant about is that there's only really one way to properly serve God. Whether you want to encourage that path or not, I mean, I think it behooves anyone to be in the business of saying that what's good for us is good for them because we have to share a planet with them. I defend Christianity always because we can't deny that they're an ethical force in this world and many times they outdo Jews regarding ethics. I mean, they keep laws whether they acknowledge them or not. This is why I think that the best Jew is a former Christian because I think they bring a superior form of ethics to the table and we have a superior theology and I think it's a match made in heaven. What I tolerate a little more is Messianic Judaism or some mosaic Judaized form of Christianity where they take the best of our religion and in some way mix it with theirs. It gives us some ground that we can share, which is Torah. If we share that common ground, we can deny them as brothers. That's what made us exceptional and important to God in the first place, accepting Torah, and that's what now makes them important to God, whether they go through a formal conversion or not. In terms of tolerating Christianity, this uh, has really been the approach of Tosfos and Ashkenazi Judaism, reiterated by the Ramah, that they did not consider Christians. The whole notion of Messianic Judaism didn't even exist back then. They didn't consider them idolaters. Yeah. Right? Uh, although the Rambam took a different approach. I mean, most people don't know that there, there's, there's a whole spectrum of different opinions on this. I mean, anyone who just listens to YouTube rabbis thinks that, oh, Christianity is idolatry and it's, it's silly. These people get stuck on first stage thinking. When you really hop into the text, the vast majority of rabbis actually held that it wasn't, and the Rambam was more of a dat yachid on the whole issue. And then nowadays, because uh, we choose to bite the hand that feeds us, everyone wants to attack Christianity when when they're really a sleeping giant. They're not a threat to Jews currently. I appreciate Christianity, but I really wish that Judaism was more equipped to welcome in converts. And I really still constantly encourage people to choose what I consider is the better lifestyle. Right? I mean, Torah really doesn't give an option for the existence or, or the possibility of there being a righteous Gentile. I mean, if you're righteous, mm -hmm. it's because you're Israel already because you're choosing to worship the God of Israel. The way we serve him is by keeping his laws. The whole notion of a Messiah is completely secondary, in my opinion. I mean, it doesn't even appear in the five books of Moses. So whoever anyone wants to think the Messiah is, is really not important to me, even if they attribute divine qualities to him. I mean, or how many Rebbes don't get elevated to a divine level? Right? And there's clearly a double standard. And well, but, um, it's, interesting that you, it's interesting that you say that I... I just finished a book uh, by Moshe Idel, uh, and it's uh, the name of it is uh, Ben, uh, like you know the sun, uh, sonship and Jewish mysticism, and it's it's an incredible book. I mean, it's 722 pages long, um, and it's it's really a review of uh, not just of, of, of uh, you know the Zohar, but so many different aspects of Kabbalah, different works within Jewish philosophy and so forth. And it's amazing that you say that because you have these kind of very similar patterns in different pockets, you know, throughout the medieval period and uh, in antiquity and so forth. So I think, I think I would say one thing is that uh, most Jews would do, would be well served to sort of expand. You talk about sort of like page one thinking that they would do well to sort of expand their learning and to realize that things are often much more complicated and much more diverse um, in the way that, that uh, one of my professors and rabbis explained it is it's like a smorgasbord. You know, you've got a lot of plates on the table, um, and sometimes people only focus in on a few entrees, but there's really like a vast, uh, you know, selection there in front of you. Um, and sometimes people just focus in on a few things, and they sort of lose picture of the, the, of the great array of, of ideas. So what area do you disagree with me on? <laughs> um well, I have to be honest, I haven't uh, kept up with your videos uh, uh, as much as I probably would like. Um, I, I've been busy, you know, with my work and, of course, writing. And then with my, uh, I've got a four-month-old plus two, two older, uh, seven and a five-year-old. So um, I think that's really the main thing. I mean, you know, I've talked about the, the conversion issue with, with friends. And some of them, of course, as I mentioned, have gone through your program. 
but it's you know it's just it's one of many topics that we discuss and they've always spoken very highly of you and uh you know i've just mentioned that it's it's obviously i guess you could say that in that sense just as as my perspectives maybe on christianity are the minority view uh the the more open approach i think is is maybe a little bit like you said it's it, it's you're you're sort of treading new ground you know trying to change the the, the way things are but uh, i understand the the rationale behind it i just i'm always thinking sort of the the, the long-term effects you know and, and so I don't know that it's necessarily a disagreement. It's just a question of the efficacy of it long term, and and how that will uh, impact the people that are involved. But um, no, I I don't I don't know of any particular major issue that I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not as controversial maybe as your other guests uh, that I've listened to sometimes. So, do you have a website or somewhere where people could learn more about your writings? Uh, yes, um, I'm trying to think of the best one. If you actually, if you if you go to uh, I guess the, probably the simplest one is, is just CryptoJewishEducation.com. So it's C-R-Y-P-T-O JewishEducation.com. That's obviously focused on Sephardic and crypto-Jewish issues. And then if you go to Amazon and then you just type my, my name in, uh, Juan Marcos Bejarano Gutierrez, uh, you know, it'll come up with all the, all the books that I've written and, and I'm always working on something new. Um, I enjoy it. You know, it sort of keeps me, I always tell people it keeps me off the streets. Uh, at night, and uh, I enjoy. I think I articulate maybe better than I do sometimes in person. But uh, you can know, on Amazon or, or Crypto Jewish Education, and and those are two ways to to you know to keep up with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Cool, Robert Gutierrez. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's a pleasure as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay, man. Thanks. Be well.